could you please join me in welcoming Carmine Gallo. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. So how many of you as Berkeley MBA students have ideas for either this portion of your career or when you leave school? Ideas for new companies, new products, new services? A few of you? Okay, probably all of you. All of you have stories to tell. And so I want to help you today tell those stories more persuasively, more effectively than ever. Because I understand that as MBA students here at Berkeley, you come from different backgrounds and you have different job functions, am I correct? But you all have stories to tell. Some people are better than others at telling their stories. This gentleman, for example, is pretty good at telling a corporate story. But every pitch that you make, every job interview, I understand there'll be job interviews coming up, Every pitch, every interview, every presentation is an opportunity for you to tell your story. So what is that conversation like? Is it interesting and illuminating and inspiring? Or is it just the opposite? Dull, boring, confusing. I think with some of the new rules of persuasive presentations that I want to talk to you about, you will learn some real practical techniques that you can use today to tell that story more effectively, regardless of whether it's a story about yourself, maybe during an interview, or a brand, or a company, or a product, or a service. Now, many of these techniques are based on this book that I wrote called The Presentation Secrets of Steve Jobs. It has become an international bestseller, and I'm really, really proud of that. And I think we can learn a lot by Steve Jobs. Because you can have, a person can have, the greatest idea in the world, but if that person cannot convince enough other people, it doesn't matter. Would you agree with that statement? That's pretty accurate, isn't it? Communication has always mattered to my clients. As Pat mentioned, they touch your life every single day. My clients are CEOs and managers of these companies, and they all have great stories to tell, and we help them tell their stories. So these are some of the techniques that I use with major CEOs and techniques that I write about in my book, techniques that I've learned from Apple and from Steve Jobs. But before I give you those specific techniques, this is the fundamental concept underlying all effective communication, passion. You cannot inspire anyone unless you're inspired yourself. You have to be abundantly passionate about your message. I believe that many of you can go on to have rewarding and successful careers without being completely passionate about what you're pitching, but I doubt you will ever reach that level of true inspiration, inspirational leadership. You have to be passionate about the message. But it's more than just the obvious. It's, it's real easy to say, oh, I'm passionate, Carmine. That's not what I mean. It's not this outward show of energy. You need to ask yourself, what is it about the product that brings me pleasure? What is it about my service that I'm passionate about? How is my product or service going to improve the lives of other people? Then you can start getting excited about it. With passion can change the world for the better. This man certainly believes that. Howard Schultz is the founder and the CEO of Starbucks. I interviewed him a couple of years ago for one of my books and some of the articles that I write. I write for Forbes and I write for Business Week as well. And he said something very interesting. He said, Carmine, when you are surrounded by people who share a collective passion around a common purpose, there is no telling what can happen. But what's interesting about Howard Schultz is you can speak to him for two hours and he'll rarely, if ever, mention the word coffee because that's not what he's selling. That's not what he's passionate about. He'll direct the conversation to a bunch of other topics. He'd like to talk about customer service. He'd like to talk about treating employees with dignity and respect. He'd like to talk about creating a third place between work and home where people would feel comfortable gathering. And what would that place look like? He rarely mentions the word coffee because that would be the obvious thing. Oh, what are you passionate about? Well, Howard Schultz must be passionate about coffee. He's the coffee guy. Not necessarily, because he rarely mentions the word coffee. Listen to this video clip from CNBC. Listen to how he articulates the vision 
behind Starbucks. And you'll also notice that the host of this particular program had the exact same reaction I did when I first interviewed him. And I think the only competitive advantage, and this is you know, an anathema compared to a tech company, is we have no patent. We have no secret sauce whatsoever. The only competitive advantage we have is the relationship we've built with our people and the relationship they have built with the customer. So when we go to You mentioned competitive advantage. You haven't mentioned the word coffee. Not but yet. Your competitive advantage is well, not your coffee. Well, I'll get to the... Well, but go, you just said your competitive yeah, advantage. It, it, I agree with you. Yeah. It's the relationship yeah. with your people and the people with, their, with the customer. And, and in fact, if you ask me what business we're in, we're in the people business. We're not in the coffee business. Mm -hmm. Of course, we are as a product, but we're in the people business. You need to ask yourselves before every job interview, before every pitch, before every presentation, what is it about this particular topic that I'm passionate about? And it's not the obvious. Howard Schultz is not passionate about coffee. Steve Jobs is not passionate about computer hardware. He's passionate about how those tools can help you unleash your personal creativity. That's a big difference when it comes to communication. In order for a message to be inspiring, it has to do three things, doesn't it? It has to be understandable. If I don't understand what you're saying, I'm completely lost. It has to be memorable, especially if I have to talk to a decision maker, somebody else in the company. How am I going to relay what you told me? if that other person wasn't there. It has to be memorable, and it has to be emotional, because we have to touch both sides of the brain, the analytical side and the emotional side, which is actually more important when it comes to persuasion, for persuasion to occur. Every pitch, every presentation needs to have some components to make it more understandable. Let me give you some fantastic techniques that you could use today. Number one, create Twitter-friendly headlines. I believe that you really need to think about how to articulate or communicate your product or service in 140 characters or less. There is a reason. Your brain needs to see the big picture before learning about the details. Isn't that interesting? That's why this slide is a problem. What's the problem with this? Too much detail, too much information. This slide was actually delivered by an economist, and you know how economists like to talk. It was delivered by a Morgan Stanley economist who had 20 minutes to talk, but she had eight themes to deliver, eight themes to get across. That's a lot of information, isn't it? I'm a former journalist, and so I watch how journalists cover the same stuff. One journalist at this particular conference said this, the mobile internet is growing faster than you've ever imagined. That was his headline. The mobile internet is growing faster than you've ever imagined. In other words, the journalist who was watching this came up with this headline. So I created that slide. I'm not a, the greatest designer, but I created that slide. What's more interesting to you? What would have grabbed your attention and really want, made you want to sit through this presentation for the next 20 minutes? Here? I've got eight things I want to talk to you about today, or, folks, the mobile internet is growing faster than you've ever imagined, and I'm going to give you eight reasons why, or several reasons why. Big picture before detail. I think this is how the average presenter would have introduced the MacBook Air. We're really excited to introduce the MacBook Air today. It's a really thin, lightweight, notebook computer. It has a 13.3-inch widescreen display, backlit keyboard, Intel processor. A lot of details, right? A lot of details. What did Steve Jobs do? He simply said, it's the world's thinnest notebook. If that's all you know, that tells you a lot. Now, you can watch the rest of the presentation to learn more. You can go to the Apple website to learn more, but if that's all you know, it tells you a lot. It also fits very easily within a Twitter post. What's the iPad? The iPad is our most advanced technology in a magical and revolutionary device. Now, he only said at an unbelievable price once. This was the first time he introduced it. This is one of the first slides. I think a lot of critics said, $800? Yeah, that is unbelievable. <laughs> so he stopped using that. But whether you think it's hyperbole or superlatives, oh, magical and revolutionary, the point is if you Google that phrase, it does come up hundreds of thousands of times because that's the way he chooses to frame it for you. And that's the point. 
That's the point. This is not, don't do these things by committee. It's up to you. How do you choose to frame the communication behind a product or a service? So always ask yourself, what's my headline? What is the one thing I want people to remember? And make sure that it's in 140 characters or less. If you cannot express yourself in 140 characters or less, let's go back to the drawing board and keep working on it. So now let's talk about act two. We gotta make it memorable. How do we create content and messaging that people are gonna remember? I have one great technique that I use with all my clients. Uh, Steve Jobs uses it, it's fantastic. Use it today, use it all the time. It's called the rule of three. In short-term memory, we can only process about three or four points of information. Why do you give people 22 points? They won't remember it all. Three points. Steve Jobs will often break up presentations into threes. The iCloud was the last of three services and software updates that he was going to talk about that day. That's the one that got all the news, of course, but when he first came out, he said, there's three things I want to talk to you about today, and he saved the best for last. But he often does this. Three features of a product, three sections of a presentation, three models of an iPad. It's all about simplicity both in the way they market and design products at Apple and in the way they communicate products at Apple. What's the iPad 2? The iPad 2 is thinner, lighter, faster than the original. That's it. It's thinner, lighter, and faster. Steve Jobs came out and he said, there's three things I want you to remember about the iPad 2. It's thinner, lighter, and faster. And let me go through each one. So again, you can use this for anything. It doesn't have to be a major PowerPoint presentation. You can use this, these concepts and these techniques in any type, of, uh, any type of conversation you're having. So the rule of three, very important. We use this all the time with major presentations or with CEOs who are going on the media or television. Another thing that I want to talk to you about regarding you know, making your story memorable is bring numbers to life. Put those numbers into context. Put those numbers into perspective. Steve Jobs does this all the time. When Steve Jobs first introduced the iPod in 2001, he said it stored the equivalent of five gigabytes of information. What's five gigs? Nobody knows what five gigs means. It doesn't sell any benefit. Oh, it's 1,000 songs. You remember that. Five gigs is the equivalent of 1,000 songs. Oh, and we'll do one better. It's 1,000 songs in your pocket. That's interesting. Five gigs of storage is not interesting. Last year, Cisco introduced the CRS3 router. Routers are pretty boring, big pieces of machines, right, that nobody ever sees. So they realize they need to make it interesting and memorable. They gotta bring numbers to life. This operates at 322 terabytes of information uh, per second, 322 terabytes of power. That's a lot of power. What does it mean? When John Chambers first presented it, he said that means it can stream every movie ever made in four minutes. It can download the entire Library of Congress in one second. Now isn't that much more interesting than saying that it operates at 322 terabytes a second? And by the way, the way they phrased this, the way they communicated it, was picked up by media all over the country. Media that you wouldn't necessarily expect to be covering a new router. Why? Because they put it into context that people understand. Bring numbers to life. And finally, we need to make your communications emotional. John Medina taught me this. He said, the brain does not pay attention to boring things. So you need to create what psychologists call emotionally charged events. Emotionally charged events are those events that elicit laughter, fear, joy, surprise. When the brain detects an emotionally charged event, it releases dopamine into the system, which acts as a mental post-it note saying, remember this. So how do you do that? How do you do that in a presentation? Well, you've already been seeing it the whole time, especially with some of these video clips. Number one, think visually. Think visually, because we're visual people. This is hard. This is hard. easier said than done. But I, I just want to introduce the topic to you so you can think about pushing your presentations to the next level. 
The typical PowerPoint slide, Microsoft makes it kind of easy to create a slide like this. What they say is, let's put a title, let's add a whole bunch of bullets in different colors and in different fonts. Uh, there's space, there's empty space, so let's make sure that we have some clip art. And of course, you know, we're MBA, so we're gonna have a chart and a graph and a line and all that. So pretty soon, this is what you get because you're trying to include all the information on one slide. By the way, I thought this was a pretty ugly slide when I first created it, until I saw this. That is a real slide that was created by the US military, and one general allegedly looked at it and said, if I can understand that, we'll have won the war. The difference in a Steve Jobs presentation, and in any great presentation, is that the slide acts as a complement to the narrative. The slide acts as a complement to the storyteller. The average PowerPoint slide has 40 words. It's hard to find 40 words in 10 Steve Jobs slides. That's about all you'll see. This is called picture superiority. Picture superiority simply means that when people see or hear information delivered verbally, they remember about 10%. Add a picture, and the retention goes up to 65%. So let's go back to the MacBook Air. I created this. This is what I think the average presenter would have done to introduce a new computer, a new product. They would have tried to put everything on one slide. And maybe they would not have paid a lot of attention to it. So you've got different fonts. You've got uh, some clip art here but I'm gonna put everything on one slide. Steve Jobs and Apple thought about it. They said, how would we describe the world's thinnest notebook in visual form? Oh, why don't we just compare it to one of those envelopes that are in the office? It's that thin. It's so thin you could fit it inside an envelope. What's more interesting? That or this? What's more inspiring? What's more intriguing to you? What's more emotional and memorable? Okay, this takes work though. That takes work, that takes thought, that takes this, brainstorming, whiteboarding, sketching. You gotta think like a director. Director doesn't just pick up the camera, they, they whiteboard and they sketch it out. So think visually before you create your PowerPoint. And one other emotional way of really appealing to people is by telling stories. Nobody tells stories, it's amazing. And yet stories are the most emotional and intriguing and interesting parts of a presentation. I'll often talk to CEOs uh, who are giving some pretty dry presentations, and then behind the scenes they'll tell some great stories. And I'll encourage them, well, why don't you tell the story in your presentation? Oh, well, gee, I never thought about that. I thought it was just about delivering the info. No, <laughs> you want to make it emotional, so tell the story. And more often than not, at the end of the presentation, people come up to the uh, leader or whoever gave the presentation, and they'll say, hey, love the story. People remember stories. Stories can be about you. Stories can be about a case study. They can be short, they can be long. Or stories can be about something completely different. Like when Marissa Meyer introduced Google Instant. She's the vice president of Google. She introduced a new technology last year called Google Instant which predicts what you're searching for as you type. It's very interesting, the way she presented it. She didn't just come out like most people would. She didn't just appear on stage and say, hey, we, we have a great new technology to introduce you today. It's called Google Instant. Uh, we've been working on it for a long time. We're really proud of it. Let me demonstrate it. And it, most people would have done that. Instead, she told a story of how search evolved over time. Here's an excerpt. And as such, and to put today's announcement in perspective, I thought... Her whole point was, what took you a day and a half in 1935 will now take you three seconds with Google Instant. Isn't that a lot more interesting than what the average presenter would have done, which is to come out, introduce their technology, and demonstrate it? Okay, that's simple. This takes thought. It's not about the slides. It's about the technology, it's about her story, it's about what it can do for you, but it's not about the slides. The slides simply serve as a backdrop to the narration. So remember to tell stories, and when you tell stories, use what we just talked about, the visual display of information. So I hope this morning I have convinced you to start thinking differently about what you do and what you can offer the world, about your brand, and about your product, your service, your ideas. See the 
genius in your own craziness. Believe in yourself, believe in your vision, and be prepared to constantly defend those ideas and that vision, because it's those ideas that are ultimately going to change the world. Thank you very much for inviting me this afternoon. You're a great class. Appreciate it.